Well, I had promised myself that I wouldn't use the word unprecedented in 2021. I was hoping we'd seen enough of those things in 2020. But here we are, witnessing something we never imagined in our wildest dreams. It's sure to become one of those where were you when moments. Every generation has had at least one. Where were you when you heard about the attack on Pearl Harbor? Where were you when JFK or Martin Luther King Jr. were assassinated? Where were you when the Space Shuttle Challenger exploded? Where were you when the planes struck the Twin Towers? And now, where were you when an angry mob stormed the nation's capital? I mean, like those other events, we'll be talking about this one for the rest of our lives. And like the others, it leaves us deeply disappointed with our nation, with our government, with our leaders and fellow citizens, and, and perhaps with ourselves. Now, disappointed may feel like too soft a word to describe what we're feeling, but, but that's what the series is about, so let's work with it a little. We've defined disappointment as the gap between expectation and reality. When we expect something good to happen and it doesn't, we're disappointed. So we expected to see a peaceful transfer of power. And for the first time in our nation's history, it didn't happen. We expected our leaders to promote that peaceful transition, but too many of them didn't. We expected our fellow citizens to respect our nation's laws and institutions, but too many of them didn't. We expected authorities to respond swiftly to protect the capital and restore order, but they didn't. And it wasn't lost on any of us that if, if the crowd storming the capital had been people of color, the response would surely have been more swift and more severe. And that, too, is more than disappointing. We expected people who profess faith in Christ to rise above such violence and lawlessness. But instead, we saw the so-called Christian flag waving from the balcony and rioters invoking the name of Jesus. Seventy-some million Americans expected President Trump to be re-elected, believing that was in the best interest of the country. But he wasn't. They're disappointed about that. But the vast majority of them are also disappointed in the behavior of their fellow citizens that day. We expected 2021 to feel like a fresh start at the beginning of better things. Instead, it feels like a kick in the gut. When we expect something good to happen and it doesn't, we're disappointed. And the greater the gap between that expectation and reality, the greater the disappointment. There are so many disappointments here, and the gaps could hardly be greater. So what do we do with all this disappointment? Where do we turn for wisdom and perspective? How do we possibly find our way to hope again? Well, well that's what this series is about. Now, I was expecting to be speaking about hope in the face of anxiety today, but we'll have to save that for another week. Instead, we're talking about politics, again, which we've done quite a bit of this past year. But we have never shrunk from addressing tough and current topics, so here we are. And while these are complex and highly charged issues, I believe the Lord has given us some helpful truths to offer. Now, I want to say up front that even though I'm doing the talking today, many of our pastors and teachers have contributed to the message representing a variety of generations and cultures and, and political perspectives. So if you hear something helpful, you can be grateful for the team of pastoral leaders that God has blessed us with. If you hear something not all that helpful, well, just blame that on me. So what do we do with all this disappointment in our government, in our leaders, our fellow citizens, and, and even in ourselves? How do we find our way to hope again? There are no easy answers or quick fixes. But let me share with you at least three biblical steps I believe we can take 
on the long and winding road from disappointment to hope. And the first step on that journey is to lament and repent of our brokenness. To lament and repent of our brokenness. Now, we've talked a lot about lament in recent years. Lament is simply grieving over sin and failure and brokenness in the world and, and in ourselves. Before we rush in to fix things or explain things or defend ourselves, we simply put our heads and our hands and weep over what's happened. We name what's wrong and we feel it. Now we're going to be looking at a variety of scripture texts today, but let's begin in the Old Testament with a book called Lamentations. Turns out lament is so important, it gets its own book in the Bible. Well, Lamentations was written, most likely, by the prophet Jeremiah, just after the fall of Jerusalem in 586 B.C. Now, Jerusalem, of course, was the holy city, the capital city of Judah, the southern kingdom of Israel. So it was both a spiritual and a national disaster when it fell to the pagan empire of Babylon. And Jeremiah watched it happen, not on his phone or TV, but in person. Listen for the shock and grief in the opening words of this book, which is in fact a song of lament. How deserted lies the city, once so full of people. How like a widow is she, who once was great among the nations. Bitterly she weeps at night, tears are upon her cheeks. It's not hard to identify with those feelings, is it, after what we witnessed the other day? We're sad. We're stunned. We're reeling at how far we've fallen. More than one politician and commentator got choked up as they spoke to the camera about what was happening. And chances are many of us got choked up too. That's lament. And it's an understandable and appropriate response to the disappointments we, we listed just a few moments ago. But, but as he pours out his heart, Jeremiah comes to recognize that much of what has happened to Israel, they brought on themselves. It was, it was the failure of the nation's leaders and people to trust God that left them vulnerable to this attack. He goes on to say, Jerusalem has sinned greatly, and so has become unclean. All who honored her despise her, for they have seen her nakedness. She herself groans and turns away. Well, in a similar way, uh, the brokenness of our social and political systems have been exposed by what's happened. It's embarrassing and shameful. And, and there's a spiritual dimension to it. As human beings made in the image of God, we haven't lived up to the goodness and glory that God designed us for. So it calls for repentance. That, that's where lament always leads, to, to own and confess our brokenness and failure. Let's jump ahead to verse 20. See, O Lord, how distressed I am. I am in torment within, and in my heart I am disturbed, for I have been most rebellious. Now, notice, Jeremiah is repenting. Now, the thing is, he wasn't party to the rebellion of the nation and its leaders. In fact, he was the one calling it out, calling them back to the Lord again and again. Jeremiah was a faithful and courageous servant of God. And yet he considers himself part of the problem. He owns the sins and failure of his people. See, lament always leads to a searching out of our own hearts. Before we rush to assign blame or fix things, we name what's wrong and we own our participation in it. And that's the first step uh, on this journey from disappointment to hope. 
we lament and repent of our brokenness. And it may be the hardest step. <laughs> you, you may be struggling with the idea of it, even now, as I say it. But hope and healing always begins with repentance. Well, what do I need to repent of? Uh, you might be asking. I wasn't there. I didn't storm the Capitol. I'm not one of those failed politicians. Well, let me name some of the brokenness that was exposed that day. And, and I'll let you decide if any of it applies to you. I'm not going to name names and assign blame today. There are plenty of people more qualified than I am to do that. My calling is to shepherd this flock, to help us process what's happening in ways that can lead to healing and hope in our lives and in our church and, and ultimately in our nation. So, remembering how Jeremiah owned the sins of his fellow Israelites, what might we need to repent of right now, personally and corporately? Well, how about idolatry? <laughs> idolatry, you might be saying. How do we get to idolatry? I don't see anyone bowing down to little statues. Well, idolatry, of course, is much more subtle and insidious than that. Idolatry is simply looking to any created thing or person for something only God can provide. Looking to any created thing or person for something only God can provide. When we look to other things or, or people for our sense of worth, for meaning, for security or hope, that's idolatry. Whether it's a, a golden calf or a shiny car or an impressive resume or a secure bank account or a political affiliation. When we identify too strongly with a political movement, when we embrace a political agenda as our primary mission, when we allow a human leader to become larger than life to us, we are in danger of idolatry. So, However you may feel about President Trump or, or any political figure, Trumpism is a problem just as any ism can be a problem. Nationalism, socialism, progressivism, even anti-Trumpism. When we come to believe that a particular person or ideology is the answer to our problems or the animating force in our lives, we're in danger of idolatry. That's why it's so important that we not allow the gospel of Jesus Christ, the kingdom of God, to be identified with any particular political party or platform or person. Because no one party or platform or person can ever fully or even adequately represent the fullness of the gospel and the kingdom. Now, you might believe that one party or person might best represent or serve the interests of the kingdom, and you might support that party or that person for that reason. But when we declare that party or person to be the only Christian option, we're in danger of idolatry. And when we identify our nation with the kingdom of God, we're in danger of idolatry. Now, there's obviously a whole lot we could talk about here that we don't have time for, but my purpose is simply to call out one of the potential sins or failures we might need to lure lament and repent of, individually and, and collectively. We'll each have to search our own hearts about how idolatry might apply to us and to the church. Well, how about divisiveness? I mean, certainly the divisive, combative rhetoric that's been flying around the country in recent years contributed to, to what happened on Wednesday. And we're all disappointed in the president's inflammatory words that, that seem to ignite that fire. But, but however we might assign blame, we have to ask, 
to what degree we might have contributed to the incendiary environment by words that didn't just criticize leaders or fellow citizens, but villainized them, demonized them, simply because they disagreed with us. So whether it was done by, by a politician making a speech, or a journalist broadcasting their point of view, or a preacher pounding a pulpit, or, or any one of us ranting on social media. Idolatry, divisiveness, how about falsehood? So much of what's happened has been fueled by, by falsehoods, by theories and allegations that, that have no basis in fact. As one senator said the other night, the best thing leaders can do for people is to tell them the truth. And so we need to hold our leaders and our media outlets accountable for telling the truth. But we also need to hold ourselves accountable to take responsibility for discerning that truth. To what degree might we have promoted or excused or been misled by falsehoods. How discerning have we been in our consumption of the media? How balanced are we in curating our news feed? Well, how about silence? And by that, I mean our failure to speak up, to speak out when we feel like lines are being crossed. Now, this is one I have to ask myself, uh, not just in my personal interactions as a citizen and Christ follower, but as a public speaker and, and a messenger of the gospel. Now, as I said, we're, we're not afraid to speak to political issues here at Grace. Uh, we, we've done that quite a few times recently. We're, we are intentionally nonpartisan, respecting the diverse congregation and community we serve, and I'm careful not to use the pulpit to promote my own political point of view. But have I, have we, said enough along the way? It's a question the, the elders and staff and I need to be wrestling with. So, idolatry, divisiveness, falsehood, silence... I'm guessing I've said enough on this point to have made everyone uncomfortable, but that's sort of the point. We lament and repent of our brokenness. A lament feels awful, and repentance is hard to get to. But biblically speaking, I believe it's the first step on the journey to healing and hope for ourselves and for our nation. And it has to begin with ourselves. So, still with me? <laughs> I hope so. Uh, we're going to move through these next two a bit more quickly, not because they're less important, but because we've talked about them quite a bit already this year. I believe a, a second step on that journey is to return to the way of Jesus. Return to the way of Jesus. Now, the way of Jesus is actually a theme for us this year. And that's why we're spending most of our time in the Gospel of Luke. And we've seen that Jesus actually has quite a bit to say about politics. For instance, we saw that when people tried to force Jesus to choose sides for or against Caesar, he refused to be put into a political box. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. <laughs> In other words, figure it out for yourselves. But don't put me or my kingdom in any political camp. When he was describing the way of the kingdom to his followers, he not only told them to love your neighbors, he also told them to love your enemies, and do good to those who hate you, to bless those who curse you, and pray for those who mistreat you. Uh, sometimes you'll hear a uh, pundit say, all politics is local. <laughs> well, they're not far off from what Jesus was telling us a long time ago. Politics, fundamentally, is about loving our neighbors, 
ensuring that the system works for all of us, that we all contribute to the common good. As someone said on the floor of the Senate the other night, it's hard to hate your neighbor when he shovels your driveway or when you shovel his. Well, when he was declaring his mission to the world and the nature of his kingdom, the, the kingdom that he was inaugurating, Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, to set the oppressed free. The politics of Jesus begins with the poor and the powerless, the overlooked, the under-resourced, the defenseless and the vulnerable. Yes, the unborn and the undocumented. And when he was distinguishing himself from the political leaders of his day, Jesus said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. It is not so among you. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. The political posture of Jesus is humility. And the kind of leadership he calls for is servant leadership. So as we survey the teaching of Jesus relative to politics, it, it's pretty clear that we have lost our way. Too many have become enamored with the pursuit of power and wealth and their own comfort. This is not the way of Jesus. Loving your neighbor, praying for your enemy, advocating for the poor and the powerless, leading with humility. This is the way. Fans of the Mandalorian are smiling right now. This is the way. This is the political way of Jesus. And it's time we return to that way. And no matter what our political preferences might happen to be. So, a repent of our brokenness, return to the way of Jesus. And a third step on the way to hope and healing is to remember that we are citizens of two kingdoms. Now, we talked about this back in the fall, but we need to remind ourselves of it again. As Americans, or, or, or whatever our nationality, we are citizens of an earthly nation, state, and community. And as followers of Christ, we're citizens of a heavenly kingdom, the kingdom of God. We're citizens of two kingdoms, and we owe a certain allegiance to both of them. And that's what Jesus was teaching his followers when he told them to give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. And that's what they did. In the days and years following uh, his departure from this earth, that's what the followers of Jesus did. All the writings and records of the New Testament affirm and describe allegiance to both of these kingdoms. No matter who happened to be in charge of the earthly one. Uh, listen to what one of uh, Jesus' followers, Peter, wrote to Christ's followers of his time. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority, or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as servants of God. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the empire. Now keep in mind that, that these Christians were living under a brutal pagan empire that was no friend to the Jesus movement. Keep in mind that Peter himself, who wrote these words, would be executed by that same empire. And yet he calls for submission, respect, cooperation, and, and even honor. Now to be sure, he also allows for resistance and protest when power is being wielded unjustly. 
Don't use your freedom as a cover-up or an excuse for evil, he says. But the expectation is that even that resistance will be honorable and constructive, unlike the behavior we witnessed this past week. Now, one of the unfortunate outcomes of all of this is that, is that it might undermine people's confidence in government and politics, so much so that they might just give up or, or just check out. Well, that's not an option for followers of Christ. As earthly citizens, we're called to be engaged with our culture, with our political system, to be informed, to vote, to rally, to speak out, to run for office, to call for reform, and even to protest peacefully and respectively when the situation calls for it. But we're also citizens of a heavenly kingdom. We believe that a larger story is being told that a greater purpose is unfolding, that a stronger power is at work in the world. And so we pray, believing that God can and will meet us as citizens and as a nation, even in our darkest hours. We pray, and, and through prayer, we, we discern and align ourselves with His power and, and His purposes. And so we pray today, that God will grant comfort to, to those who were injured in the melee and to those who might have lost loved ones. We pray that he will grant wisdom and courage and, and unity to leaders who turn to him. And we pray that he will use this moment as a wake-up call for the nation and the church. That individually and collectively we might repent of our brokenness, return to the way of Jesus, and to remember that we are citizens of two kingdoms. Uh, but even as we do that, we want to remember that, that while we're citizens of two kingdoms, our hope is in Jesus Christ, the King of Heaven. <laughs> remember that our, we are citizens of two kingdoms, but our hope is in the King of Heaven. So well, let's finish where we began today, in the book of Lamentations. It's a song, we said, a song of lament over the brokenness of the world and of every earthly system. And, and, and we're feeling that brokenness today. But it's also a song of hope. In the midst of his lament, even as he walks among the ruins of his city, Jeremiah writes these words. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is good to those who hope in him, to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Now, these words remind us that as dark and disappointing as these days might be, it's always morning in the kingdom of God. The Lord's love never ceases, and His purposes never fail. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in Him, to those who seek Him. So may we serve our nation and our Lord well by being these kinds of people. May we remember today and always that our primary identity isn't political, but spiritual, as followers of Christ and citizens of his kingdom. Our overriding mission isn't political, but spiritual, spreading the good news of Jesus in word and deed. And our infinite hope isn't in any political party, platform, or personality, but in our present and coming King, Jesus Christ. Well, thank you for listening today, friends. As always, if we can be of any help to you spiritually or otherwise, please just reach out to me, brian with a y at grace.org. 
And I'll invite you to join us this evening as we come together as a congregation for prayer at 7 o'clock. You can find the link on our website. Well, let's enjoy this next song, and then Cynthia and Jimmy will come back to close things out. 